ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back once again to the Adventures in History Land YouTube channel. Here, uh, once more, is an All Things Waddington episode, and that means Marcus is back. Hello. Cheers. Hello again. Cheers. And uh, today is the is the sort of the payoff of this this series within a series. Uh, on all things Wellington, where we have talked about Wellington and Waterloo and the Waterloo campaign. And today we are talking about the battle itself on the 18th of June and specifically Wellington's part in it. It's kind of our belief that actually this is an Allied victory. There's a lot of historians who debate is it, is it a French defeat? Is it Wellington's victory? Is it a uh, Prussian victory? And certainly a lot of thought about the Prussian victory. But if we kind of come down to it, being an allied victory, the, the Prussians and the allied army working together, which involves the British army, but with all the other nations uh, heavily involved in there, and they them working together, and that we, we will cover that. But because of this, is we've entitled this All Things Wellington, we're not ignoring the Prussians, but what we're going to do actually is talk about Wellington and more like his experience through the battle, mm -hmm. uh, it's like sort of his major events, rather than trying to encapsulate what is one of the most complicated, one of the most... Um, one of the most hotly debated and also, you know, one of the most written about battles as well. So rather than just doing that, we thought we'd try to focus in on the Arthur Wellesley himself as the Duke of Wellington. And, uh, and then we can kind of bring it together through a slightly different angle, hopefully. Indeed, because if you talk about the Duke of Wellington at Waterloo, you talk about Waterloo. And this is all things Wellington. And this is Wellington's battle. And so we have some topics that we're going to cover that will help us to to show uh, Wellington's progress through the battle and what he has, what, and the challenges he has to overcome to hold his ground yes. against Napoleon. Because it is going to be a classic um, defensive position. He's going to uh, use his uh, famed reverse slope tactic. This is the key. The reverse slope is the 19th century, um, is the 19th century concept of dead ground to hide your troops using the natural cover in a 19th century way. It's not like today where you'd use all cover, it's you hiding like brigades in- <laughs> Into uh, thousands of men, horses. Yeah, behind, pulled to the ground, any obstacle you can get to deceive the enemy, to make him unsure of what is there, and to protect them from artillery fire. And artillery yeah. fire is a big killer on the 19th century battlefield. So the range is so different. Um, a musket uh, back then, typically firing at like regimental level, all thousand or so men, is about 80 yards, uh, less than 100 metres. Those artillery fires can fire over miles, but it's a subsonic weapon. What does that mean? It means that you'll be able to see the flash and see the round coming towards you quite slowly. So when these men are fighting in blocks, they can literally see the cannons be manoeuvred in the battery towards them and then they'll see the rounds coming towards them, but the, the tactic is that they don't move. The uh, exception to his reverse slope is Wellington's guns, and the majority of his guns were on the forward of the slope. And uh, one of the first like Wellington points uh, for this is that uh, early on in the battle, uh, they actually spotted uh, Napoleon riding uh, forwards. Now, when you stand on the battlefield of Waterloo, it is surprising, not even using the Lion's Mound uh, monument, which is a huge bank of earth that you can uh, climb up, they even just stood uh, along the top road uh, between the Lion's Mound and the what's known as the Elm Tree Crossroads, where, uh, where Wellington spent a lot of his time. Um, you can see uh, the Belle Alliance, uh, which is uh, Napoleon's kind of forward headquarters. He was roughly around that area. It's on the kind of the other slope, the valley. It's a very gentle valley today. Um, I believe that it was about five meters deeper. Um, there is a, is a yeah, there, there's a couple of watercolours painted in the field which shows a distinctive um, kind of trough. It's meant to, yeah, I've, I've heard it was meant to be about five metres deeper, but then they've lost about five metres from the top of the lion's mound to make the lion's mound. Um, but it would have led to a slight, a, a more of an incline, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, but I think 205 years of ploughing. Yeah, and, and more pronounced sunken roads as well. Yes, yeah, definitely. Um, 
but you could you definitely today without using a telescope or binoculars or anything you can clearly see even the outline of the doors of the Belle Alliance and Napoleon's headquarters so the, early on the artillery think well, it clearly um, spots uh, Napoleon riding uh, up and down his lines and it's a famous moment of Waterloo um, it's in the movie it's in most books where they have a name it's a great dramatic moment Napoleon goes out and sees his troops. French sources say they either yell their heads off, um, be blanc wearing uh, his procession, or um, some of them just salute or don't do anything, uh, apparently. And British sources and allied sources, however, do mention some sort of a commotion. But uh, I don't remember who it was um, who actually decided he he's, he's with his guns and he's sighted sighted Napoleon on a white horse apparently riding across the front of his army. And he says, quite accurately, he is in range. He goes over to Wellington and yes, he says permission to open fire and Wellington refuses. He says it is not the business of commanders in chief to be firing at each other. There's a couple of, now this is an interesting thing to unpack. First thing to say about that is because he has given an order forbidding his artillery to engage the enemy. They're, they're to be selective with their targets, essentially. Only things, only enemy that are directly threatening them are to be engaged, and they are not to engage in what is termed counter-battery fire. No counter-battery fire. Though that so, is particularly ignored, mm -hmm. no counter-battery fire. I mean, there's no certainty that have hit him anyway, to be honest. I mean, no, they'd, no. Have, they'd have sent, like, eight balls at, it, at his staff, probably killed a staff officer or two, but it's uh, odds on... A moving target is going to be difficult to hit directly. To pick a man on a horse, certainly on a grey, which is yeah. a white, isn't he? Um, but I think it's a bit more like if you see a, a bee buzzing around and you keep trying to swipe for it, you're just going to provoke it. And he doesn't need to do that. He's got a bit more weight. So one of our first uh, kind of Wellington points of the Waterloo is he refuses to directly target uh, Napoleon. Now he's just going to basically strap in and ride out whatever Napoleon throws at him, uh, awaiting the Prussians to arrive, and then he will attack. That is the plan of the entire day. Napoleon's not changing his tactics. We said earlier he's going to come on with his frontal assault. And uh, he comes on in the same old style. In the and same I, old he, style. And what does, and what does uh, Wellington say there, Josh? I believe uh, he says something to the effect of then, uh, and, we'll, uh, and, we saw, and we saw them off in the same old style. He said this a little after Waterloo, I believe, uh, when he was describing it to somebody who asked him. Uh, uh, he said they came on in the same old style and we saw them off in the same old style. So well, what does that mean? Let's, let's discuss that. What does coming on in the same old style mean? So the, the French same old style is... To the British to the British is, is the columns. It means that actually you can, from, the, from a column, which the, the British army advance in column all the time, but they don't fight in column. From a column, you can either form into a line or into a square very easily. And actually you can get into a square incredibly quickly. As we've previously talked to like Capture Bra, from a line, it's really difficult because it means your side two, your flank uh, companies have got to come all the way back and into the rear. They've got hundreds of meters to cover. The same old style for the British, in line is they perfected something called platoon fire. They're into their 10 companies. They, each company is normally made up of two platoons, which isn't so much a, uh, a unit uh, in 1815 as it is today. But what it means is each company will break down into 50%. So you've only got 20 like, designated units to fire. The theory of this, and it works incredibly well, is the first platoon fire, then the second and the third. By the time you've reached the 20th, hopefully the first one's reloaded. And so it means that by the time you've reached from the first platoon to the 20th, the first one's reloaded, which means they fire again, then the second and the third, and it repeats, which means the ear is going to sound far more like a machine gun because you're going to have blocks of, like, in theory, about 50 men. It's obviously going to have got less as they've got in casualties, but it's going to be well over 20. They're firing and they're firing. That means that 80 yards away, 50 yards away, incredibly closely, you're going to be losing a huge wave of men completely and repeatedly. That is going to be a morale-destroying uh, weapon. 
For the men further back, they are going to be stepping over the bodies of their officers and of their comrades. And they're going to see huge destru um, destruction, which means that the manoeuvring out doesn't happen. Um, so that is the same old style. Now, curiously, the French know this. That is the Duke being overly simplistic about what happened at Waterloo. The French know this very well from the Peninsula War. In the Peninsula War, they would use regimental or battalion columns. That's it. And, and whereas the British would usually fight by battalions, the French would often have regiments in the field that's up to three battalions. And they would attack with each battalion in a column, moving up a slope often, and get volleyed away by single battalions because one battalion's, one British battalion's frontage in line, two rank line, roughly equals three French, two to three French columns uh, battalions in column. They know that from Spain. They know that this is what the British do. They know they know the same old style. And so there's some sort of a disagreement. There's some sort of a conversation that occurs just before the first attack where this is changed. And they don't attack in the old style, although the attack in column is the same old style. They attack it with a slight twist. They attack in divisional columns. That means you have an entire battalion in line at the front, followed by the second battalion in line, third battalion in line, fourth battalion in line, brigade, second brigade moving up. And this that is the way the first corps under General Delon is going to attack Wellington's left flank. This means they do not have to deploy in line. That means they just have to march up and open fire. When the British watching it, they're describing it as columns. But actually, it's a series of sequential lines. Um, Absolutely. But especially to the, um, the observers there, the, the young officers who haven't been in the peninsula, maybe, let's say, they haven't seen this. So they've heard about the French columns, and that's what they think they're seeing. Mm -hmm. And what they haven't also seen is, really, they've never seen a massed battery before. Everybody talks about the Grand Battery. All the Allied sources, and certainly the British sources from Spain, had not seen a massed battery like the one that Napoleon forms at Waterloo. Um, really, no, not in the size. There was a battery, I believe, at uh, Talavera, a massed battery at Talavera, and I think there might have been one at Vittoria as well. But this was an 80-gun battery, about, some say more, and this is the herald of the main assault. After the action at Ugmoor begins at around 11, 11.30, it's debated, but that's the accepted time. The resulting, uh, the result is the first crisis of the battle, which is resolved by the Earl of Uxbridge, who, having seen the attack developing, sees that the cavalry will be needed or possibly needed. And anticipation is a great thing in general. He anticipates that there may possibly a need for a cavalry charge, and he has his, and he has two, two brigades of heavy cavalry ready. And they are moving up the slope as the French are moving up the slope, both sides the, of the slope. The Union, which is known because it has Irish and uh, Scottish horse, and the Household Brigade, it's made of the two lifeguards, the first lifeguards, second lifeguards, and the Blues. Absolutely. Now, Wellington has very little to do with this situation, actually. He's not on the spot. He's over at Ugamore watching that develop. He's very worried about his right flank, and for that reason, we won't dwell greatly on what happens next because he arrives once it's all over, um, which you know is interesting because he's usually on the spot, but Uxbridge is on the sh on the spot at this stage, and he orders the attack. The cavalry, and, yep, and his cavalry atomize the French infantry attack. Two eagles are taken. It ends in disaster because British heavy cavalry are unable to rally properly reform and uh, protect themselves. They overstretch, famously known as galloping at everything and then galloping yep. back. But they don't get back. But they do get the two eagles, they do uh, obliterate Durlon's uh, core. Certainly for several hours anyway. The, the, it's, it's, it's two or three divisions are com a complete wreck and need, will take hours to reform. Uh, the light cavalry have to charge in to save the remnants of the heavies. They take terrible casualties as Napoleon's cavalry counter charge. And um, that leaves a kind of a stunned 
silence over the field except for the fighting at Ugamor and the fighting at Laysan. The first, and this is bad news for Napoleon, great news for Wellington. He has survived the first attack, a very serious attack, which could have succeeded because his left flank is very weak. He, he, it was a huge effort of the Lons Court, a huge force coming up. Uh, uh, as we said at the beginning, Wellington probably thought the Prussians would be there by now. And things... Like you said also, um, he's over at Hougamont. Uh, that was meant to be a distraction from Jerome Bonaparte going in. Now, traditionally, you say, actually, it's not because he, Jerome just keeps going in. He's just throwing men to the walls like a medieval siege gone wrong. Uh, but it does distract Wellington's eye over to um, the West. It does. And, uh, but he, but thanks to Axbridge's ca well-timed cavalry charge, uh, Napoleon's main battle-winning strategy, which is completely as simple as batter away through to Mont Saint-Jean, which is at the edge of the Forest of Soignes, uh, behind Wellington's position, where the main field, one of the main field hospitals are uh, for the Allies, uh, it's now his entire plan is in, in ruins. Yeah. Not only that, he has strong indications that the Prussians are indeed on their way, and he has to divert troops to to watch out for that eventuality. Not only towards that, while waiting, indeed towards Plan Saint Noir, and. Uh, He's only just now got all of his troops up onto the field, really, um, with the destruction of Delon's corps. Only now has he even got everybody he needs on the field. Um, Which roughly brings us on to our third Wellington moment. It does. Where Which Napoleon actually takes time off the field. He, we think probably he's told to leave by his staff, but he at least goes back for about two hours. He's He's got piles, hemorrhoids, or stomach ulcers, or possibly early onset cancer. So he goes off. And roughly that similar time, it kind of seems to overlap. Ney uh, is put in charge, and he seems to witness a manoeuvre back, it seems. Now, there's some debate, a lot of debate, about whether it's regiments that have been exposed that are moving back to the reverse slope, or whether it's a constant stream of casualties that are coming back and then going up the road. Or possibly a combination of both, uh, quite likely. And then Ney, the bravest of the brave, with his famous red hair, uh, he then uh, decides to launch his famous uh, cavalry charge. He does. Um, like you say, there's quite a lot of confusion about why he does this. And that is absolutely... Uh, I mean, it's, it's pr probably the only logical thing. It's the most logical explanation you're going to find as to why it happens. There is another one that's put forward by Andrew Roberts, that it happened by accident, and Ney kind of um, just tries to see it through, where some movement uh, on the British, on the, on the Allied side, is mirrored slightly by troops in advance on the French side. And... Um, an entire advance happens by accident. There's a French uh, account that speaks of this happening, and I think Andrew Roberts suggests that Ney just says, well, maybe we can put a lot of pressure onto Wellington by throwing our cavalry at him. Um, it's unusual because it, so far it's been quite cannon and artillery with those, you know, the heavy brigades um, from the British cavalry, but otherwise um, the cavalry had much less of a part, and here they take the centre stage quite literally. Yeah, the French have a great strength in cavalry, as opposed to the Allies. This is not to say that it is a well mounted or anything like that. Well, or, I was going to say they took a long time to rebuild it. After eighteen twelve, I've read that they needed over fifty thousand new horses uh, because of the Russian campaign. Where either they much less, few of them had died in battle, as they had died through exhaustion, or as a source of food for the soldiers. And obviously, two years more war followed 1812 so no even though territory. so even though uh napoleon uh has a larger cavalry force than wellington it's not particularly brilliantly mounted um or very large by the standards of what was once considered large now i get very confused about this section of the battle 
because there is no clear linear narrative to how it goes. As a general expression, the Allied infantry will, will now continue the day moving in and out of a square formation or a rectangle actually because they're doing this from column and as you said earlier in a column which is essentially a big rectangle what you do is you just get every company except front and back well except the front to change the change which direction they're facing in to outwards it's a very if it's a very difficult passage of time as you're saying because um, nobody can count how many of these are cavalry charges how many of them is just a break between divisions and yeah. regiments not how many is people retreating or whether there's a tactical withdrawal to it's a it's a maelstrom it also melds into the action at les Sans, which we'll get to later but um so the dynamic is this the french cavalry will, will attack the british and allied artillery open fire on them now, at the last minute they're supposed to leave their guns and run to the squares as we talked about with zach and uh, return to the to the guns when they leave. They are they are driven off by supporting Allied cavalry behind the squares, the checkerboard of squares, which because of the way they're deployed is a, is kind of a like a chessboard. Yep. Yeah. And every time the French cavalry come up and their momentum is broken by having to negotiate through these squares, the Allied cavalry will come up, fight them, and chase them off the ridge and the Allied gunners are supposed to come out and fire into their backs. It's more confusing than this because some every Allied battery along the ridge does something differently practically, and this goes just on and on and on for hours. Amidst this is Wellington and his staff, and he's going from square to square trying to make sure everybody's standing properly, everybody's not too exposed to artillery fire, that they're not too shaken by the, the monstrous assault of cavalry, that is coming at them. And he's saying little words to different officers and and and, and uh, sort of just by his presence reassuring them that he's not bothered by it particularly. And there's lots of there's lots of uh, there's lots of accounts of it. it's a it's a great moment whenever he enters one of the squares. It's still um, is almost a pride, isn't it? So he's he's <laughs> on Copenhagen, his famous uh, charger, his horse. He's really reliantly uh, putting him around the battlefield with a with a core of uh, his aide de camps and his staff officers, and people are always really quite fond. They go, oh, all of a sudden we saw some British officers coming towards us. We opened up, let them come in. There's even stories that he's almost pretty much jumping over, like Captain Bar, where people don't get out of the way. And Copenhagen and the horses are jumping over, and then they're going, oh, it's brilliant. Well, now we're going to be really resolutely, you know, we're defending ourselves, protecting the Duke. <laughs> Duke and who do you want to have with you and uh, they we said I think before that uh, Wellington says Napoleon's worth uh, 30,000 men but Wellington's own men said we'd rather see Wellington than a reinforcements of 20,000 men so you're, you're in your little island your cluster being attacked but you're defending your commander in chief your general officer the Duke you know it's, a, it's incredibly uh, esteemed title Field Marshal the Duke of Wellington he's there and so he's and he's going around and he knows that actually going around, it's increasing people's morale. He's a micromanager. Uh, he likes to give individual orders to regiments. There's not a lot he can do amongst the big picture here. It's it's individual units fighting for survival. But uh, he's so busy. The moment there's a lull, he's leaving one uh, square and into the next. And there's uh, I think there's one account of a of a sergeant or something like that that speaks of him entering a square. And the word is that as soon as he enters a square, everybody sort of picks themselves up a little bit. And the sergeants whisper, "All right, stand straight, boys. Duke's here, and uh, or old Nosey's here, uh, and." <laughs> And he's just going to just going to grow the extra two centimeters. It's never. This is one of the muddy bits of the battle because nobody really explains when the French cavalry charges stop. But it's certainly the pressure is so great that they have to remain going in and out of square and taking horrendous casualties, especially towards the center. Wellington famously rides up to squares, shouting out to them to stand fast. We must not be beat. What will they say of this back in England and things like that? And Marshal Ney, who is in command of this, these cavalry charges, um, 
is in increasing levels of uh, uh, fury. He's had horses shot from under him, several of them now. Um, a attempt to support the attack by sending in, I think it's Bachelor's division of Rai's corps, is driven back, and uh, it's just a very confused moment of the battle. I believe the pony <laughs> back from his one to two hours rest, and he sees the mess, and he's turning to his staff, and he's basically saying, why did you allow this to happen? Uh, and he doesn't stop it, doesn't weirdly stop enough. It. Weirdly enough, he does it's not stop page. it. So all he can do is, after a point, he tells Ney to take the liaison. And so as these now intermittent cavalry charges are wasting themselves on the Allied squares, Ney flings a whole bunch of, well, what remains of he can gather of infantry together at liaison. Now, this has been holding out for hours. And the long story short here is that they have run out of ammunition by some by late in the by early evening, I think it is. They run out of ammunition. Uh, they don't wait to the last round and try to make a break for it. Quite the opposite. They fix swords because Baker Rifle's got a beautiful sword bayonet onto it. And uh, they keep fighting. But eventually, uh, the French get in to La Haisant. They fight hand to hand for a while. But then there's a back gate, and they know that they, once the French start coming in, it's like a swarm. They're not going to be able to keep them out, and they start to have a fighting retreat, and they start to run up the slope. But it falls. It is not recaptured until the end of the battle. And this is the crisis, the crisis of the battle. What happens to cause this crisis is that Ney, having got this great platform from which to attack the ridge, brings up some artillery batteries, puts them as far forward as he can. Ney's supporting cavalry now comes up the ridge again because Le Saint has fallen and they're going to try and make merchandise out of this because he wants the Allies to stay in square now so his guns can play on them. What he also does is this ushers in a point of the battle which I've heard described as the part played by um, the Grand Bands, uh, the Great Bands, where Ney basically turns line battalions into skirmishing battalions and sends them up in big, big, uh, big networks of skirmishers to just harass across the front of the position because the allied skirmishers can't exist in the valley anymore because of all the cavalry. And so they shoot, they just start putting weights of fire into the allied center. Now, the, this is the crisis for a reason because it's argued that if Napoleon had committed reinforcements at this point. He could have forced Wellington to get off the field. He may not have won, because we need to also point out the Prussians are now heavily engaged at Place Noir behind Napoleon's right flank. It take, and because it takes the Prussians so, so a good few hours to get decisive force built up to actually make a good enough impression, it appears to Wellington, who's really focused on just holding the ridge, they actually don't appear until much later, even though they've been there fighting for hours by the time he actually knows they are there. That's perspective, isn't it, really? Mm -hmm. it's, um, I, I agree. It, it, the, the Prussians are there, but they are actually, you can't really see much of France Noir from the ridge. Um, it's off actually behind the ridge, of the Belle Alliance ridge. Um, and so it's not until uh, they're coming up near like the Papillot area and that farm. Yeah. And the uh, Frischmont and Pap uh, Papillot and Frischmont um, that they uh, are actually like visible. So actually the Prussians are there quite early, but it's going to appear that they uh, are not. That's something to remember because remember as well, Wellington absolutely thought the Prussians would have been there in great force by now. So he's actually afraid they're not coming at all. And that's a big deal when his center is in such dire straits. However, because Napoleon does not commit more troops to the center on Mont Saint Jean Ridge, instead he's kind of in two minds about what to do. It seems there is um, th there is time enough to reform the lines to gather troops in, and it's around this time as well. We should say that with that mindset, he has Wellington has probably already said the famous words: "Night or the Prussians must come." Sometimes it's put forward by the like the Prussian school of thought, the Prussian victory, and uh, there, there obviously is a, a rival school of thought, the British victory. And I think we friendly come down in the middle, uh, and this isn't 
Wellington saying, I really need the Prussians. It's, a, you know, the Prussians are going to win the battle. This is the closing of the trap. This was the plan that was set out in his mind on the 16th of June, on, uh, written down on the 17th of June, and certainly since the morning. This is the closing of the jaws of the trap. Well, it's at least it's kind of one arm of a, a swing trap coming through. Because the Prussians now make themselves known to Wellington. General von uh, Bulau's um, division is now in the field. I believe General von Zeiten and, uh, uh, is also there. So that's two corps. A third will appear as well. Um, I think it might be Pirk, uh, or however you pronounce it, uh, appears as well. And that allows Wellington to shift, to grab troops from the left flank and move them over to the right flank. Things stabilize. Um, and we reach the, the final throw of the dice. For some reason, Napoleon, he looks at the battlefield and says, maybe he should have said, if I haven't won the battle by seven o'clock, maybe I won't win it to the extent I need to. And maybe I should try and get out. No, instead, he says, I can still win this battle. He looks around him. And what does he see? He's not got the young guard there anymore. He sent two battalions of the old guard over to Place Noir as well. The Alain's corps is just about back in line. Uh, Lobar's corps is kind of sh uh, shot because it's been fighting the Prussians all day. Ray's corps is completely lost over at Ugamore with Jerome. And the cavalry is also a huge problem because he should, he obviously wasn't thinking logically. He did not remember Borodino at all, it would appear, because if you lose your cavalry, even if you win, how are you going to chase them down? So, and if you lose, you don't have a, a rear guard. Exactly. So on all these points, what happens next is deeply questionable. But he says to Ney, now you can have the Imperial Guard. And so, that basically means the middle and old guard. I believe there is a, there's a personal touch from Napoleon. Uh, I believe he, he tries to follow in the advance. He does. Actually, he's, it's not far short of uh, La Haisance. He's riding because there's a, there's a road there. And he's ordered back because he's well within uh, artillery range. And uh, casualties are coming in thick and fast. He's ordered back. I mean, it does make you slightly question his, his mental state of things. Later, uh, he will actually say, I should have died at Waterloo. On St. Helena, he actually says that. I think almost he, he wishes he did, isn't it? It's, I think so. But the, the guard uh, advance, and this is where there is actually some additional confusion for the, the British where they're reading the first hand account and what they're seeing, because uh, it's always uh, marked on the, the bearskins. But actually, um, French uniforms are a bit literally uh, foreign to us. Um, it's not only like the Imperial old guard who wear bearskins, they also have um, chasseurs, which are actually light troops wearing big bearskins and other elite companies. So it does get a bit confusing that, uh, especially for the British, they always think they're fighting uh, <laughs> the, the old guard or, they, or the grenadiers possibly. Uh, and actually it turns out the majority of the troops there are the middle guard. Yes, and much like Napoleon's guard, um... The British guards, who uh, guards, foot guards, uh, from General Cook's division, I believe, um, uh, making up Maitland's and how do you say it, Bing's or Bing's brigade? Bing's basically, Bing's. the Y. Yeah, <laughs> uh, have been out on the right flank. Um, that's why a lot of them end up in Ugmo. But a good proportion of them are in squares. Uh, this, uh, what happens next is a lot to do with Wellington's powers of anticipation. He anticipated the great cavalry charges, hence he was able to get everybody kind of in squares for it happening. And now he's uh, managed to see a big attack developing all across the French line. It's not just the old and middle guards. The entire French line advances with them, actually, what's left of it. And he sees it coming and he pulls in every reserve he can. He has people coming in from Brandello, um, way back in the right flank, and he pulls in the guards a little further to plug a few gaps. And uh, this is him preparing to again hold the ridge. Absolutely. Uh, the Imperial Guard is, is 
what comes up. Uh, most of the, the entirety of the middle guard, the majority of the old guard, supported by remnants of cavalry. And there are, there are, there are definitely supports. Um, people have done a lot of work on British regiments. You, you're right, there are actually line infantry regiments coming up too. Uh, it is supported to an extent by artillery and cavalry, but just less than it needed to be. Yeah. Pretty much, it is the majority of the working part of the French army that's not fighting that Hougamore. And, uh, and against the Prussians is, is kind of come up. And there's a really nice uh, moment here. Yes. Well, like I said, he's a micromanager, but he also he's got he's got a good touch uh, with the men. He rides, rides over to the guards as the imperial as the uh, middle guard reaches their position. He either says, "Now, Maitland, now's your time," and Maitland and Maitland's now orders up, or and I know uh, I was reading Miguel de Alava's um, diary, who's the Spanish witness, and he's slightly further back, but he sees. And it, he either rides up himself and actually has a quick word with the guardsmen uh, and talks to them. And as part of that, because they're lying down the majority of the regiments to, um, to keep themselves hidden, uh, which is something we haven't mentioned, but he does actually order the regiments to lie down. He actually orders them to stand up and is possibly thought to have said, up guards and atom. But either now, Maitland, now is your time, or up guards and atom. And basically the guards, regiments stand up and deliver this deadly volley fire, this deadly platoon fire at very close range against what's probably the middle guard of the Imperial Guard. Almost certainly, yeah. The, Imperial, the old guard are there, but they're probably actually uh, slightly further back. They're on the right flank. They're actually coming into contact with the Dutch. The, the, the guards, because of the, the hats confusion, uh, it should be known as, um, they think they're fighting, uh, they, they think they're fighting the grenadiers of the old guard, but actually they're probably fighting the chasseurs of the middle guard. Um, so one of those regiments, um, they, they, they're meant to have picked up these chassis of bearskins and they become known as the Grenadier Guards. Sorry, they actually should be known as the Chasseurs Guards, <laughs> yeah. which would just not sound good. They're outside Buckingham Palace today, the Chasseurs are defending the Queen. It's far too uh, Francophile. Yeah. Uh, it's all these nice little bits of history. They hammer them with close range volley fire. The middle guard can't take it. Colborne of the 52nd, and that brigade has done excellent work actually coming down to the forward slope before this, but the 52nd now wheel out of the main line. It's a left wheel, I think, uh, left wheel forwards onto the flank of the middle guard and they fire into it. It breaks. It's timing again, wonderful timing. It's, it's now closing the box in and they're basically now being fired, pursued far from three sides. I know that the artillery right, that they basically, they're loading now double shots. Which yes, is double canister. And, and ball or double canister, and they say they just can't miss. And so Wellington says, now goes back once the firing is, once they're in retreat, he goes up and says, uh, goes right over to Colborne's brigade, actually. He rides straight across to them. And he says, go on, Colborne, they won't stand. Uh, that's it, and he starts to ride up again. Now, just before we get to this very exciting moment, we'll mention that on the right flank of this, uh, the Imperial Guard's attack was met gallantly by the remnants of the, not only the British line battalions who actually did give ground in front of the Imperial Guard, but because they were just so savaged. Um, but the certain Brunswick regiments, certain Belgian regiments, and most importantly, Chassé's Netherlands division, who is fresh from the rear, this guy is very interesting. He fought in Spain against the British. Yeah. And he is called General Bayonet by Napoleon himself because he loved his bayonets. And as the Imperial Guard are coming over, right flank of the Imperial Guard are coming over the lip of the crest, they are met by this blue wall of Netherlands infantry led by this redoubtable nutcase, General Bayonet, and he packs them down the ridge uh, with support of his um, with his with support of his artillery, this is the end of the Battle of Waterloo. Wellington now goes on a famous ride across his entire um, line, and it's said that uh, regiments on the left could hear the sound of cheering from the right, getting louder and louder and louder and louder. And this is Wellington's parade ride across his line as he goes forward. Rides his hat up. Exactly. Exactly. Very like he doesn't like cheering he doesn't like no. men he's respectful, but he's i think it's it's the relief 
It's not even it celebrating the league. They have won. And they're not all going to die. And they're not all going to have to fight again tomorrow. Yeah, he's standing on the ridge now. He comes back onto the ridge. And he, he, give, he raised his hat in the air. And he says, the entire line will advance. One of his staff says, is that Wait, wise? <laughs> is that wise? And he goes, in for a penny, in for a pound. And uh, in, true to Wellington form, he does... He does ride across the line, and whenever somebody cheers him, he says, no cheering, lads, just go forward and complete your victory, and then just carries on. Um, and, but, and he follows them forward as well, because they're still fighting to be done. They need to, the ca light cavalry charge forward. Axel Richard gets hit in the leg, yes. and it's taken from the field. Uh, there's a, just, a, as you're saying, it's just an immense sort of sense of relief and, and a sense of action as he goes forward. Wellington goes forward to make sure everybody keeps pressing the French as, uh, as, as hard as they can to make sure they, they break, because everybody's running now. The, 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 the cry, la garde recule, has gone up across the, across the French line. Um, it, 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 previous to which, well, Napoleon had gone and ordered his, troop, ordered his uh, officers to tell the troops that Grouchy had arrived, that the Prussians were yeah. Grouchy. To get them to advance with great elan. Now but, they're being fired from their flank. Yeah, Prussian artillery has come up and is now pounding the road, and they realise, okay, it's over. Uh, as far as I'm aware, the uh, Imperial Guard have never been beaten before. Certainly not as a as a corps as they're fighting in such a large unit uh, like that. They've got a legendary status. They they call themselves the Immortals. The rest of the French army call them the Grumblers because they're always at the rear. They've got they've been paid this bit more money. They've got legendary status where the rest of the French army slightly resent them because of this elite status. It seems, but um, to see them suddenly beaten, uh, that's one thing. And then to be fired upon by the flank and there's a confusion of oh, but you just told us that was Grouchy and they're coming on. It breaks them. That's the moment. For apart from um, some of the old guard, it's pretty much then a, a total. Retreats. I mean, there's a fighting retreat. There's elements that the um, British are having to fight them up. But it yeah, is because a... there's actually a certain amount of fire coming at Wellington that one of his staff officers, uh, again, one of his few staff officers who are left, tells him, "You should, you know, we can't lose you. You have to get back." And he says, "Basically, the victory is won. My life doesn't matter anymore. If it's I get really killed cool. now, how later? Yeah." <laughs> Uh, even if you know, even if it was the least competent officer at 7:30, once the battle's won, it's going it's a surefire thing. This all adds up to an advance as far, at least, as La Belle Alliance mm -hmm. uh, for the British and Allies. Um, at this moment, Wellington is assisted by maybe just a handful of officers. There's a there's a Sardinian liaison officer is one of them. I think Alava has been around. I'm not sure if he's still around. Right. I think Al Alava goes forward as okay. far as I read. The group around Wellington is really small because so many of his aide de camps, his staff officers, Uxbridge, are killed and wounded. Um, the, the, at the beginning, they would have had over 30 staff officers and ADCs. By the end, I think you could probably count them on one hand. And him and his small staff managed to pick their way through the field, you know, avoiding friendly fire. <laughs> and they meet uh, Blucher somewhere. Some, I mean, there's, as always, there's apparently, I've, I've recently read that there's some confusion now as to where they actually met each other. But it's it's legendarily said that they met at La Belle Alliance. It's certainly in that vicinity. Yeah. Um, and there's there's also some debate whether Blucher sees him and he's so relieved he hugs him. Yeah. It's stories that he gives him a huge Prussian bear hug. Um, or if they shake hands, but there certainly is um, some beautiful paintings of them shaking hands. Yeah. I think it could be a hug. I mean, for the same reason that Nelson said, "Kiss me, Hardy." Buddington, I, I can completely understand this kind of this brotherhood bond. It wouldn't be weird to see someone no, no. hug them. But uh, Blucher apparently just says to him, "My, my lieber camarade, care fair." Blucher is going to continue the pursuit. And Wellington, now practically alone. As you said, almost alone. If not by himself, probably distant to his two or three men that are with him. The, he's now crossing the main part of the battlefield twice. And just want to put it into context that 
it's about the battlefield's about two miles deep, about three miles wide. So he's driving that that two miles plus the additional um, two miles to his headquarters. But that two miles um, would, has in it around sixty thousand dead or dying men. Actually, we know of at least three women. I'm happy to be told of more. Uh, and also, it's going to have tens of thousands of dying horses as well. It's an absolute scene of carnage. Now, that's six miles, 60,000 dead or dying or wounded. British and Hanoverian horses, which Jarvis doesn't count the Dutch and Belgians. Apparently, here it is. Killed 1,495, wounded 891, most of whom would be killed because horse veterinary surgery is what it is. And that's not counting the horse, the French or the Prussians. And that's, and that's quite a thing. Um, Wellington is a man who he, he loves opera. He loves art. He loves music. Uh, he loves he loves Copenhagen. His horse he's on. So he's, he's, he's riding back and um, he, his headquarters is incredibly busy with um, an amputation taking place on his table. But actually, as he's uh, dismounting, he's been on his horse, Copenhagen. Um, for about 17 hours, depending when you count from. He doesn't, as far as anyone knows, get off for any reason. So, And he's dashing, as you're saying, from Hougamont up to um, the east flank, incredibly busy. And uh, he's uh, got a, a really close bond with Copenhagen. It's taken him through most of the Peninsula War. But when he gets off, he's got a bit of a surprise in store. Yeah, uh, because as, as much as Wellington is now feeling the strain of the battle, Copenhagen who is untouched uh, and has been a, uh, a solid, solid companion throughout the entire battle, as he later said, though he was not a great looker, but for bottom and endurance, I never saw his better. Um, Copenhagen is feeling a bit highly strung. Wellington gets off, he's weary, he's tired, he's drawn and drained from the battle, and he gives his friend an affectionate pat on the back as he gets off. And he must have been towards the rump when he did this. He must have like got dismounted and turned around the back, which is a dangerous thing to do. Copenhagen felt this and lashes out <laughs> with a with a kick that really it's would have almost near his head. Yeah, which really would have cook did what no French gun had done the entire day if it had landed. It'd be a sad state if um, Copenhagen <laughs> Copenhagen had killed Wellington. It would be. Awful. Um, almost humorous to the um absurd to the, yeah. It would be terribly tragic. Talking, he wouldn't have bought actually house and his legacy would be very different. Mm. But um yeah, he he narrowly misses getting kicked by his loyal Mount Copenhagen on a, on his way into the into the into the headquarters building at Waterloo, just to show uh that it wasn't just the people that uh, were in a bit of a state at the end of the battle. He goes to his bed. Now, his bed's been requisitioned by Colonel Gordon, uh, one of his close aide-de-camps, who's dying in it. He's been shot. He's, been, he's, he's basically almost dead. So he can't go to sleep. This is a man who woke up at three in the morning. It's now, um, I think it's about half past nine at night. It's getting late, yeah. It, it's past sunset. Um, and he, he sits down, he starts to write his famous dispatch. Uh, during that time, he is given... A quick dinner with Miguel de Alava, who we've mentioned, uh, because he's pretty much the only um, senior officer on his staff who's not wounded. Uh, and Miguel here's the first first hand account. And during that time, Wellington goes off to his uh, his chambers, uh, well next door actually, because he can't go to bed, and uh, carries on writing the dispatch from the town of Waterloo. In this time, his personal surgeon comes in, and Hume, hands it? Hume, uh, surgeon Hume, who's uh, civilian surgeon on his own staff and um, he writes has what's known as the butcher's bill so he sees this list and it deeply affects him we say he's seen those 60,000 men uh, 7,000 horses dead and died he's seen some of them killed next to him Uxbridge um, wounded next to him Delancey his um, quartermaster general uh, killed right next to him well mortally wounded next to him he's now got a lingering death for about 20 days and Wellington, um, he admits it's deeply affected him, but what we don't expect is um, the surgeon Hume um, says he, his face is all dusty in his 17 hours in the saddle. And um, he's, he starts to see the, the tracks through the dust of his tears um, 
and Wellington grabs his hand and he shakes. We think for a long time, like over five, ten minutes. Uh, and, he, and he then sits by himself for about half an hour. He's basically sitting and crying in his room. He is upset. He is traumatised by it. I think it, it tumbles out of him because he begins to repeat this message to anybody who'll listen to him as he realises he's won again. But then it suddenly kind of hits him that, you know, famously, his famous quote about war is roughly contained in one or... Th- I don't know how many times he writes it down and he tells some people it. Uh, Lady Shelley. Yeah. <laughs> Which, Which is never so melancholy as a battle lost next to a battle lost. Mm-hmm. And like you uh, said, it's what he said to him. Uh, I think it's his way of dealing mm-hmm. with it. Uh, I wouldn't go so far as saying he had PTSD, um, which we know like Pixon basically did, and there's discussion whether they did. But it's, it's close. He's scarred he's... But with, a mod, with a modern sense where he's going to not, maybe not have flashbacks, but he doesn't want to talk about it. Later, mm-hmm. He writes about it to some people, uh, mostly ladies, for the next month or two. He writes his official dispatch. But later on in life, he doesn't recount the battle. He hates to talk about Waterloo. For a very long time, he does not talk about Waterloo. And he, this, and uh, after the battle, I should say, he does not like to talk about Waterloo. In the days following it, he will tell anybody he can talk to about it and how tough it was. Again, but, I think it's a coping mechanism, get it off your chest. Mm. If you've got something in your personal life that's upsetting you, you want to go and yeah. talk to a friend and, and one way send a conversation, don't you? Mm-hmm. But he's, he, he really, and it's really interesting because he talks about the mask of command and he, ha- he does this excellently and he only lets it drop a few times in the peninsula. And he really explains it well at Waterloo because um, he says things like, please don't congratulate me. Um, I'm heartbroken. Uh, It it is so bad to lose so many of one's friends, even if it's a victory sort of thing. I'm not I'm I'm massacring the quote, but that's sort of what he says to some people. And he says that when I am when the business when the business is on, uh, I'm too busy to think of anything, but feel just wretched afterwards. And there's this this pattern in his life. After very trying battles, it it kind of wrecks him, and he 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 can only do, and he can't really he can't really. It, it's, as you say, it's a coping mechanism after Waterloo, is that he he will grab anybody, he'll talk to them about it, he'll tell them news, he'll tell them he tells who is it is it. Uh, Creevy or Croquet uh, in Belgium, in, in Brussels, about how it was a it was a it was a damned nice thing, the nicest thing you ever saw in your life. He, he, he has it takes about three days or something like that for him to, or two or three days at least, for him to just absorb it all, because he goes. Not only is the battle over, and he has to deal with all the you know paperwork pretty much. But he's he's got has to, admin to do yeah, he has to then go and see all his dying friends. Three days later or so, the advance continues. But Waterloo is a scar on Wellington's life as well as his most his what is thought of as his greatest military achievement. Certainly politically it is. As a battle, it is a great test of endurance. And as we can see, when the mask of command he has a great control over his emotions when he's in battle. But when it's over, sometimes if it's as bad as Waterloo, then he cannot help but the release, let the release just sort of take its flow before he can rebuild that Iron Duke-like facade that will allow him to continue to command. Because he's still, in some way, that sensitive, daydreamy little kid who likes to play the violin that never really wanted to be a soldier. And he no. says later, but I fought my last battle and it is a bad thing to be always fighting. We've come to the end of the Waterloo and the Waterloo story and Wellington's story at Waterloo. And I think the best way we can wrap this video up is to say that if you come, that you can learn a lesson from the Duke at Waterloo, which is that war is nothing to enjoy.
No. And it's a bit it's a business he was good at, but it is a business that he did not enjoy. War, as an American general said, is hell. And it is really something to be avoided, if at all possible. It's something to be commemorated. Um, but because, not of how, because of how terrible it is. How terrible it is. Absolutely it is. something to be commemorated. The first battle that I'm aware of for the British, that all soldiers, never mind their rank, are issued the same medal. And uh, it's a rank equaliser. Yeah. Uh, and so it's something to be commemorated. Respected. Not, not just on the 18th of June, but at the forefront of our minds always. Yeah. And respected for that reason, it is a combination of, uh, of, of triumph and tragedy. And it is said, many people argue, over, I think we both of us can agree in a moment of semi-partisan uh, uh, acknowledgement that we both believe Wellington to be right when he said that he did not think it could have been done if he was not there. And I always say that I, it is an allied victory, absolutely. But if you take Wellington away from it, it becomes an allied defeat. It was, there's many parts to it. He is but the conductor of a large orchestra. But without it, all those instruments, however good they are, wouldn't work in conjunction. And he is turning the handle of working with Blücher, the Dutch and the many allied nations. I'd agree. Mm -hmm. And so with that, ladies and gentlemen, we thank you for watching uh, this week, and we hope to see you again in future episodes. Please uh, watch, uh, if you haven't seen all um, uh, Waterloo Remembered content done by Zach White, please go and look at the hashtag where you get all the information you need on Twitter um, and on YouTube, I believe, as well. Uh, and Zach Dead White History mm -hmm. and his website, The Napoleonicist. Exactly. The Forum and all of um, the Napoleonic stuff. It's not our stuff, um, though we've been helping. Uh, mm -hmm. Is up there a lot more about Waterloo. Please share around. If you like the video, please subscribe it and do all those things that show that you enjoyed it and that tells us that we can, we will, uh, you know, you want us to do more. And it's until it's really for um, people's entertainment in these strange times. Absolutely. Uh, and so we hope you enjoyed it. And we hope to see you again uh, in the comments uh, below. Um, and, and so until the next time.